From the Lung Health Foundation, we would like to uh, welcome Jennifer McKinnon. She is a respiratory therapist and certified respiratory educator at the Lung Health Foundation, where she has for the past three years been leading the work in the provider education and clinical services area. The Lung Health Foundation is a leading health charity dedicated to ending gaps in the prevention, diagnostic, and care of lung disease in Canada. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight's session, Dr. Anthony Durzo. Dr. Durzo is an associate professor at the University of Toronto, a utopian researcher at the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. He is also the director of the Primary Care Lung Clinic in Toronto. He has a very keen interest in promoting respiratory health and primary care and has uh, had the opportunity to do so at the local, national and international levels over the last 30 years. Uh, Dr. Durzo, thank you very much for being with us tonight. I'll let you introduce our speaker for tonight's session. Uh, thank you very much, Claudia. And it's a, a real pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Liska, who I've known uh, you know, for many years now. Uh, you know, being with the Lung Association for 30 years, I think, says a lot. Um, uh, Dr. Liska is a, a, a great uh, a physician, a great speaker, and great teacher, and uh, is a full-time academic appointment at the Western University uh, Schulich School of Medicine. Uh, he's an associate professor of medicine uh, there. He's a respirologist um, and a researcher in the program of experimental medicine uh, and also professor of, of uh, health system innovation. Uh, Dr. Liska's clinical interests are focused on asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, and complex uh, airways disease. Uh, his specific research and health system innovation program includes evaluating the impact of air quality on health, advancing integrated disease management models of care, building high performing health teams, and creating health solutions that support patient activated collaborative self-management. Uh, the overall objective of his team's work is to improve patient health outcomes uh, and clinical experience while improving health system performance. So Chris, thank you so much for doing this tonight. We all look forward to, to hearing from you. Thank you for the warm welcome and welcome to everyone that's um, online tonight. So let's start with a few disclosures. This program has received uh, support through an unrestricted edu educational grant from AstraZeneca Canada. There have been several strategies to mitigate any potential uh, bias. Uh, the content tonight was populated based on a needs assessment. Uh, conflict of interest forms have been completed by the uh, planning committee. Uh, all relationships have been disclosed. Uh, industry was not represented on the planning committee and the Lung Health Foundation has monitored the progress of the development of this CME event. Uh, I have some disclosures of my own, which you will see on this slide. Uh, I will not go through them, but you can see them in front of you. There are three main learning objectives for tonight. After participation in this webinar, we expect participants will be able to uh, recognize the importance of objective measures, including spirometry, to identify and classify COPD, to be able to discuss the importance of exacerbation reduction across all COPD severities and the impact of those exacerbations on patients' uh, survival, lung function, and on their quality of life, and to describe the value of certified respiratory educators and the interplay of allied healthcare in integrated disease management uh, programs. For the format of this presentation, what you're going to see is I'm gonna walk through each of these six practice points. What is the role of primary care? How do I define, meaning you define optimal assessment and intervention for your patients? What are your goals of therapy? Should you intervene early to treat exacerbations? Who should you refer to a specialist? And how could best care COPD help you to achieve some of your patient-related goals? So let's get right into it. What is the role of primary care in the management of patients with COPD? Well, first of all, primary care is the foundation of COPD care. Andrea Gershon published this um, a few years back, identifying what proportion of patients had seen a respirologist 
In fact, about 11% of patients with COPD had been assessed by a respirologist. The opposite of that means about 90% of patients receive all of their COPD care in primary care. So the strategy that uh, our group and others have used is to support and empower primary care to work upstream to improve patient outcomes and also um, to improve system performance. We know patients with COPD have a high burden of symptoms of exacerbations and an increased mortality. We also know that the system um, is often stressed by patients with COPD who are in need of acute care services rather than upfront preventive services. And there are a lot of people in Ontario who suffer from COPD in the range of a million patients and a quarter of those likely in a high or rising risk category. So this is a substantial challenge for our patients and a substantial ch challenge for our health system. So for tonight's presentation, we're going to be wrapping the content around a case. Uh, if you were at session two, uh, you would, uh, in session one or two, you would have met our case, Mary. Um, as the series uh, builds one presentation upon another, uh, Mary also becomes progressively more severe. And so we're going to reintroduce Mary in, in this uh, uh, presentation now, and then once again a little bit later on. So we have a short uh, patient vignette, which I will share with you, uh, and then we'll summarize it and discuss it to follow. Hello, Mary. It's nice to meet you. Your family doc has sent you along to me to see if there are things that I can do to help with the management of your COPD. In order to get started, can you just tell me your COPD story, how it impacts you and your life? Um, I've had COPD for about 10 years. It was pretty manageable at the beginning, especially when I quit smoking, and I thought that would be my new norm. Turns out it's not so much. Um, in the last couple of years, I've had to slow down more and more. Uh, I, I have to take it really easy. I get out of breath very quickly. And despite that I use my inhalers regularly, it seems that the cough bothers me more than anything else. So can you tell me more about your symptoms of cough? In the daytime, the cough's not too bad, but at night I find that I'm up coughing all night. It wakes me out of the dead sleep. Um, and uh, I have an awful lot of uh, mucus and tightness on my chest. I also uh, have a little bit of a urinary leakage problem. It sounds like the cough really intrudes into the quality of your life. I'm sorry about that. Can you keep going and tell me more about the shortness of breath part, how it impacts your life? I used to go for walks on the street with my son and my and his wife and kids, but I really can't do it anymore. Um, I find that after a few steps, I even on even ground, I still have to slow down a little bit, and it just takes too long to get a walk in. Mary, it seems like shortness of breath does impact on your activities. Can you give me a sense of what happens or how it affects you at home? You know, a lot depends on how I sleep the night before and whether I can go back to sleep or stay asleep. When I wake up tired, I feel like I'm dragging myself all day. The shortness of breath is worse. Uh, the coughing is worse. Everything is worse. I find that I can do stuff, um, but it's much easier if I have a good night's sleep. I see. Now, have you experienced any flare-ups uh, of your COPD? In the last year or so, I managed to stay out of the hospital, but on two occasions, I, I had to call the pharmacy and get my antibiotics and steroids and start my action plan. Yeah. Did your action plan help you when, it, when you used it? Uh, both flare-ups occurred after I had a bad cough and a lot of mucus and very tightness of the, in my chest. Um, I was out of breath and coughing nonstop. My blue inhaler wasn't working very well. 
And when that didn't work and it's, it became worse, my chest and the mucus became worse, I called the pharmacist and got my medication and got on my action plan. Sounds like that's the right approach. Well, let's spend a few minutes now talking more about things that we could do that might improve your symptoms and your flare-up risk uh, and the management of your COPD. Thank you. So that's the case vignette. And you can hear many things, I'm sure, uh, in Mary's story that are quite familiar to you based on your experience in your practice with your patients. Very common exacerbation, got a viral infection, settles into my chest, increasingly productive cough, more short of breath, progressively worse. And in this case, Mary has an action plan uh, which was effective for her. So just to recap, she's 62 years old. She used to smoke cigarettes. She does not anymore. She's had COPD for 10 years and it is getting worse. Cough is a significant issue. She's short of breath, just walking a few minutes on level ground. We, we completed a CAT score and it's at about 21, meaning there's a moderate to severe impact on her quality of life. She's had two exacerbations this past year treated with prednisone and, and antibiotics. She has a long-acting antimuscarinic inhaler. She is taking it on a regular basis and her technique was reviewed and it is good. So this is the time for you to jump in and to try to answer a question. So based on that clinical profile with Mary, what would you recommend as the following treatment for her? Would you suggest that she stay on the LAMA? Would you consider switching her to an ics lab combination? Would you switch her to a dual bronchodilator with a long-acting beta agonist, long-acting antimuscarinic? Would you add inhaled steroid to the LAMA? Or would you go to triple therapy? And there could be more than one correct answer, so you're welcome to um, identify more than one selection and submit uh, the poll. So very good. Not very many people suggested to stay on the long-acting antimuscarinic as monotherapy, um, um, which is certainly would be problematic, I think, under the circumstances, because we told you that she is taking it regularly and uh, that her technique is good. If we had said that neither of those things were happening, I could understand perhaps a few of you might have selected that. Um, but most people wanted to switch up. Um, uh, looking at the numbers, a majority said go to dual bronchodilator therapy. You could also have done a switch to ICS LABA. I would have, I would have accepted that as a choice for her. Um, a couple people wanted to add an ICS to the long-acting antimuscarinic. It's non-standard. Uh, it would be a consideration, but not a generally following the guidelines tightly. And some of you were probably impressed by the fact that this is someone who had a big impact on quality of life, two exacerbations in the past year, and you might even step her from monotherapy up to triple. And so I think the best answers there would have been uh, switch to LABA. LAMA, uh, go to ICS LABA or go to triple therapy. And I think all of those using your guideline knowledge and your clinical judgment would have been correct. Well, how do you define optimal assessment and intervention? I just need to spend one second talking about confirming the diagnosis. The treatment algorithm depends entirely on whether you have decided this is COPD or asthma or asthma COPD overlap. And we'll come back to that. We want you to initiate 
treatment according to the guidelines and assess the risk for exacerbation. In this case, I would characterize Mary as a frequent exacerbation phenotype because she's had more than two uh, prednisone or antibiotic requiring flare-ups this year. And that means it's very likely that next year will look the same. We're gonna talk briefly about gold risk categorization, but she would be a gold D patient. I'm not going to dig into the details of the slide. It's here only as a reminder for me to talk to you about obtaining objective confirmation of your diagnosis to ensure that you're managing somebody with COPD. In this case, we're seeing a spirometry where there is moderate airflow obstruction, which did not reverse significantly in the laboratory on this date. The FEV1 to FVC ratio is less than 0.7. And so uh, it, it meets the criteria of a post-bronchodilator FEV1, FEC ratio less than 0.7, which is supportive of a diagnosis of COPD. Now, when I'm diagnosing airways disease, I don't always know the diagnosis the first time I see a patient, the first time I get spirometry. I certainly have seen patients like the one on the prior spirometry who after a treatment trial improve their lung function dramatically and have an asthmatic component or occasionally they just have asthma. And so it is recognized that there are some people who have features of asthma and who have features of COPD. And somewhere in that mix between those two, we can uh, land at a diagnosis of asthma COPD overlap. It is not clear at all what asthma COPD overlap really is, but generally you could think about it like somebody who has some features of asthma, maybe had childhood asthma or as asthma at a young age, is an allergic individual, demonstrates a lot of symptom variability over time. And when you do their spirometry, they have significant reversibility, but not to normal. Someone with that profile who normalizes their lung function has asthma. Somebody with that profile who's a smoker and cannot normalize their lung function completely could have asthma COPD overlap if they have at least asthma type reversibility on their lung function, 12% um, and 200 milliliters. What are the primary goals of therapy that we have for our patients with COPD? We want to prevent exacerbations, improve symptoms, and Below the red box, which has been our primary focus for years, we can start to talk now about reducing mortality in this population. I'm going to show you that data. So let's come to the Canadian guidelines and just walk through the treatment approach. In general, the treatment approach is start with a mono agent like Mary, advance to dual bronchodilators, and finally advanced to triple therapy. The pathway to triple or the mono dual triple approach is good most of the time with some exceptions. And you can see that represented in the diagram as we go from mild to moderate and severe. So here for a small subset, you could consider using salbutamol PRN as their only treatment. I always challenge you, if that is a management strategy that you're using, to really focus on whether those patients might benefit from a longer acting bronchodilator, because many times people minimize symptoms and in fact require or would benefit from a long acting antimuscarinic or a long acting beta agonist. Monobronchodilation with either of these would be the first choice. If that's inadequate to control their symptoms 
or if they're experiencing an exacerbation, then we advance therapy. In those that have a low risk, not marry, but in those that have a low risk, starting with a long-acting antimuscarinic, advancing to dual bronchodilators, and then to triple therapy to control their symptoms would be the usual pathway, mono, duo, triple. In higher risk populations, you are allowed to skip a step, if you will, like we, we saw in Mary's case, she was on Alama alone. She had a high risk of um, COPD flare up because of her prior history. And so she required advancement for her exacerbation profile. She required advancement for her symptom profile because she was limited from a symptom point of view. For those that are at high risk, if they came to you even on no bronchodilator, no long-acting bronchodilator, according to the guidelines, you could skip right to a dual bronchodilator or an ICS long-acting beta agonist combination, and if need be, still advance to triple. Uh, we'll come at the end of the talk to talk a little bit more about additional oral therapies, but a couple of other things I want to point out to you about this slide. You'll see that the arrows in this green box really only go in one direction, meaning if you have a high-risk COPD patient, it's usually a pathway of escalation, and we would not normally step these people down. On the other hand, those who maybe are driven by symptoms alone, you could consider cautious step down if they have been overtreated at some point. I finally want to talk about the uh, asthma COPD overlap uh, group. Uh, they were discussed in the 2017 Canadian guidelines. People with some features of asthma and some features of COPD, they do not have fully reversible disease. In this population, you're focusing on their asthma component. And so the starting point there is not a mono or dual bronchodilator. They get an ICS LABA combination because they need the inhaled corticosteroid component to manage their asthma. The next step after that would be to increase the ICS dose or to go to triple therapy. So in a nutshell, that is the treatment algorithm for COPD. And if I put it all on one slide, the emphasis is on managing symptoms, cough, dyspnea, and exacerbations. The general pathway is a pathway, to, progressive pathway to triple. But think about ACO in patients who have a high risk of exacerbation on nothing, the guidelines would allow you to start with dual. And in those that have high peripheral blood eosinophils, you might think about an ICS earlier in their regimen. For patients with mild to moderate disease, there is a more prominent role for dual bronchodilators. For those who are exacerbation prone with more severe disease, um, there is a preference for ICS containing strategies. And so um, generally step down therapy, not recommended for high risk individuals. So five key practice points based on those guidelines. Let's stop for a moment to talk about the gold based risk categorization. And I, I guess to be clear, I don't necessarily expect uh, my primary care colleagues to be categorizing people by gold risk categorization. Uh, if you wish to, I'm happy for that. This is what I do as part of my practice. But I want to show this to you just to frame the thinking, if you will, around risk stratification and um, where you would be focusing uh, on therapy. And so if we talked about the bottom left corner, the gold A patients, these are patients who have mostly good days from their COPD. 
their symptoms are relatively minimal. You can measure that out by CAT score, CAT less than 10. Uh, their dyspnea scale is uh, low MRC, MMRC, zero to one. So most days for them are good. The gold B patients, these are individuals who get short of breath when they're in a hurry or when they're going up hills. So not a ton of symptoms, but regular symptoms on hills or when they're rushing. The bottom tier here across the bottom A and B, these are the lower exacerbation risk patients. They might have had one flare up, but they haven't had a hospitalization. They haven't had two or more flare ups per year. In the top panel, there probably are very few people who are in fact gold C patients. So let's focus on gold D. Mary was gold D. A lot of symptoms, a high CAT score, MMRC scale uh, greater than two, and high risk of future flare-up because of her history of prior exacerbations. So let's go back to the case for a moment. Mary's health status has now declined and she has had a hospitalization, in fact, a hospitalization requiring bi-level positive airway pressure ventilation. When I'm seeing her next, she still has the cough. She's quite short of breath and it's affecting her ability to leave home. Her CAT score is even higher. She is severely impacted on her quality of life and she's having flare-ups over and over again, about four per year, including the one where she was hospitalized She's now on triple therapy and she has good technique. So she's doing things as she should. She's still experiencing flare ups. So let's check back into the vignette and play a little bit more about uh, Mary's case and let her tell you the story. Hi, Mary. It's good to see you again. I guess things have changed quite a lot since we last talked. Can you tell me what's happened? It's been a tough year. Um, it's made me realize how bad things can become. The flare-ups uh, are my main concern and when symptoms start, I never know how they're going to turn out. One of the flare-ups led me to the hospital this year, as you probably know, and I really want to avoid going to the hospital if I can. I've been taking my inhaler and following my action plan, and now I wonder what can be done uh, to help me steer clear of the ER. Yeah, I noticed that your last hospitalization, you actually had to go on the BiPAP machine. Can you tell me about that experience? It was scary. I didn't like having to go through that experience at all, but I realized that it's necessary and I hope to never have to do it again. Since I've been hospitalized, I can see that my COPD is really limiting my activities. Um, I want to know what I can do to continue spending time outdoors with my husband and my granddaughters um, and walking my dog. So I want to ask you a bit about goals of care, and I, I'm hearing what you're saying for your goals, but maybe a corollary of that is if you needed to have the BiPAP again, would you accept it? If the BiPAP is necessary again, I will have to have it. I won't have a choice, um, but I would like to know what to do on a daily basis to avoid this experience if it's at all possible. So then let's continue the discussion around ways to prevent these flare-ups, to intervene early, to manage them, uh, to uh, ensure that this doesn't, uh, or that the likelihood of this happening again is reduced. So the next uh, practice point was what goals of therapy to consider for your patients. And Mary has actually un uh, clearly outlined what her goals are. And they align very much with what we would generally say are, are our common goals for managing patients. She hopes to never have an exacerbation again, especially a hospitalization and BiPAP use. She wants to continue with her daily activities, including uh, spending time with her grandchildren and walking her dog and walking with her husband. And if she requires BiPAP, she wants it. Um, uh, she uh, certainly is not prepared at this point to consider 
a, a, a no a ventilation, no BiPAP, a no resuscitation approach. So let's look at some of the evidence um, around um, triple therapy. Um, uh, this is the IMPACT study. Uh, this was a study that really looked at 10,000 patients and compared three different treatment strategies. Uh, if we start on the left side, looking at moderate and severe exacerbations, these meant patients had prednisone or antibiotics in emergency department visit or a hospitalization. So it's that combination. These are true moderate and severe exacerbations. Uh, this was a population that came into the study who had moderate and severe COPD, like Mary. If we look at the lowest rate of exacerbation, that was achieved with triple therapy, uh, fluticasone, uh, umeclidinium, and volantarol, a steroid, a LAMA, and a long-acting beta agonist. The second best treatment strategy also contained an inhaled corticosteroid, and that was fluticasone volantarol. And um, the, uh, uh, the uh, baseline, if you will, or the comparator was the dual bronchodilator. And what you can see was in this population of moderate to severe patients who had previously had an exacerbation, the inhaled corticosteroid containing therapy was the best strategy. And if you only looked at hospitalizations and compared dual bronchodilation to triple therapy, there were many fewer exacerbations, uh, hospital exacerbations in the um, uh, uh, patients who were on triple therapy. This is supported by another large study, the ethos study. We're talking about closed triple therapy um, uh, uh, you know, in the last case with Trelegy. In this case, we're talking about triple therapy, a new closed triple that we expect to come to the market. Let me orient you to this slide. This is uh, budesonide, glycoperonium, and formoterol. These are both of the ICS containing arms to the left. The dual bronchodilator is here in the middle, and the budesonide formoterol, or as you would recognize the trade name, the Simbacort is here. And you can see the same pattern. The very best strategy for exacerbation reduction in this population, triple therapy, second best, ICS LABA, and the uh, platform here was dual bronchodilators with a similar uh, identified uh, um, rate of exacerbation reduction, 15% uh, versus ICS LABA, and 25% for triple therapy, more or less. So we have two large studies, IMPACT and ETHOS, on two different triple therapy combinations demonstrating in a population like Mary, marked reduction, marked prevention of moderate and severe exacerbations. And perhaps even more importantly, and aligning with Mary's goal, here is a look from the IMPACT study on mortality. And what you can see is in the um, uh, triple therapy arm and, and in the ICS containing arm, there were significantly uh, fewer deaths, a relative, an absolute reduction of 0.6 or 0.7%, a relative reduction uh, that was substantial. And this was statistically significant. And the mortality reduction was confirmed in the ethos trial, suggesting this is a class effect from the triple therapies in this population. Well, I promised Mary that we would try to find ways to prevent a flare-up and that I would take strategies to try to uh, prevent her mortality, stop her, or make it less likely she would die. And so practically, uh, how can you do this in your practice, especially in a busy practice 
with full schedules where it's difficult to get people in quickly. I want to first make the point, uh, I think the previous slides do make the point, that early intervention is important. Hospitalization is a very significant life event for patients and it impacts our system substantially. In Ontario, 28,000 COPD exacerbation admissions per year. Now, also, the mortality associated with COPD exacerbations is high and on parity, if you will, with historical data around myocardial infarction. So how can you do this? One strategy is providing an action plan. Uh, should you provide an action plan with a prescription for antibiotics and prednisone? I certainly would say, yes, you should provide an action plan and probably a prescription for antibiotics and prednisone, but I'll give you some practical advice on that. Certainly, this is the recommended treatment for an acute exacerbation of COPD. Early intervention can prevent hospitalization. Patients are very familiar with their exacerbation experience. For many, it's similar over and over. They know what it is, what the symptoms are, and they're very comfortable activating their action plan. These are high risk events. If you have access to a certified respiratory educator, such as in the best care program, you do have that additional support for your patient to, uh, for them to become, uh, uh, to develop self-efficacy. And action plans are guideline recommended by major august bodies in the context of team care, such as is provided by the best care program. So here's another level practical approach, if you will. If you have a low risk patient, someone who's never experienced an exacerbation, let's give them an action plan so they know what the expectation is if they get into trouble. And for the first flare up, probably they're going to contact you, your educator, to guide them through how to, um, when to initiate prednisone and antibiotics and to follow through. But in a patient who has had prior flare-ups and at high risk of future flare-ups, I would recommend adding a prescription for prednisone and antibiotics so that they can self-activate at 48 hours without having to run into the office to schedule an appointment to wait over a weekend to delay therapy. What are common questions that I get asked about the, uh, particularly about providing a prescription for prednisone and antibiotics? Isn't this reckless antibiotic stewardship? Uh, what about blood sugar management? Uh, am I gonna impact on INR and aren't I going to have an impact on individuals' bone density? And so, yes, um, I think we should all be focused on antibiotic stewardship, but I would also argue this. These are high-risk COPD individuals. Um, they're at risk of hospitalization. They're at risk of dying. And we know the treatment for this uh, COPD exacerbation is prednisone and antibiotics. And so, I feel like the risk profile here for early intervention strongly supports uh, a prescription. Um, uh, the risk benefit ratio, if you will, is favorable. We always want to prevent them, but when they happen, we need to intervene early to manage. The next practice point question that we put at the beginning is who should you refer to a specialist and really, if you're not sure about the diagnosis, please send them on to someone with an interest in airways disease who can help you to sort that through. Sometimes it's quite difficult to sort out. People with lots of exacerbations or poor symptom control, patients with COPD who have been hospitalized, who somehow have gotten stuck on prednisone, who are severe enough to have home oxygen, or may have complex disease, asthma, COPD overlap, bronchiectasis, atypical infection, or the like. 
So my specialist type analysis of Mary would be that she has COPD and we have objectively confirmed that diagnosis based on the spirometry I showed you. I would risk categorize her as gold D because now she has been hospitalized. Uh, she previously had severe exacerbations and she certainly has a high symptom profile and a reduced quality of life. She's a frequent exacerbation phenotype. She has the classic chronic bronchitis phenotype with her persistent chronic productive cough. And she's had a recent near death episode. Uh, she required non invasive ventilation to save her life during her last hospitalization. At this point, I don't know her inflammatory phenotype. As you know, there's more conversation about looking at peripheral blood eosinophils as biomarkers in the management of patients with COPD. So I'm going to ask you another question, and this is a difficult question. So which of the following therapies would you consider for Mary now? Remember, she is advanced to triple therapy. So she already is on a closed triple and we have done our usual things to make sure she is adherent and her technique is good. Would you add oral theophylline? Would you put her on to chronic prednisone therapy? Would you add Daxis to her regimen? Would you put her on to azithromycin? Or would you prescribe N-acetylcysteine, NAC as a mucolytic agent? And, and again, for this question, you can select more than one answer. Yeah, so oral, oral theophylline, um, I, I see a few people have selected that, about 8%, some uh, wanting to put, the, put Mary onto some prednisone, a few for Daxis, about 40%, and for a macrolide, about 65%. So the macrolides look like they win the day. Uh, in the next slide, I'm going to come to talk about these various agents as those oral agents at the end of the guideline uh, pathway, if you will. So for those of you who said oral theophylline, it is 100% still in the guideline. Low dose theophylline preparations are still recommended. Uh, I've shown you my answer. I never prescribe theophylline anymore for COPD. Um, um, uh, that is my uh, practice pattern, and I guess primarily relating to concerns about interactions and uh, a limited impact, I think, on top of closed triples. But the evidence is there. They're still in the guidelines. Oral prednisone, uh, generally we're using it for managing exacerbations, um, not for long-term use. Uh, occasionally, however, we have patients with frequent flare-ups who land up on oral prednisone. Uh, I would always, as a specialist, work hard to understand why and to see whether I'm able to taper them off. In general, long-term use is not recommended for the management of COPD, but we all know, everyone on this call, uh, on this teleconference knows that we, uh, <clears throat> we do sometimes get caught with oral prednisone. Now, there are other options, particularly for the chronic bronchitis phenotype. Daxis is one, and some of you selected that. Um, I have used Daxis in the past. Uh, the evidence is now older, um, and Daxis was developed at a time before we had closed triple and agents like that, but it is of benefit. Uh, according to the literature, it is in the guidelines, and you certainly could consider it here. One of the limitations is in Ontario, there is no uh, ODD coverage for this medication. Uh, the macrolide azithromycin, 500 milligrams, three times a week, 250 daily, um, has been shown to reduce exacerbations in the frequent exacerbation phenotype. 
I use it a lot. I find it to be quite effective in that profile with three or say four or more exacerbations per year. It is highly effective. And the mucolytic and acetylcysteine can be uh, purchased without a prescription. 600 milligrams POBID would be the dose. And it is a guideline recommended choice for the chronic bronchitis phenotype to help loosen secretions. So another polling question for you to keep you um, sharp. Uh, which of the following non-drug strategies would you recommend uh, for Mary at this point in time? A written action plan without a prescription for prednisone and antibiotics, a written action plan with a prescription with, for prednisone and antibiotics, referral to an educator, referral to a pulmonary rehab program, or to a specialist. You can select more than one answer. So many would provide an action plan with a prescription for prednisone and antibiotics. Um, educators got a strong vote, pulmonary rehab, a strong vote, and referral to the specialist also. Many of you would be considering that. Mary's a complex COPD patient for sure. Those are great answers. So I want to talk to you just for a moment about drip best care. I can see that my time is coming short, so I'm going to move through this part quickly. But the opener for this is um, um, our team has been working very diligently now for many years to work to support primary care um, um, in their own practice, managing their patients with asthma, with COPD, uh, with heart failure and atrial fibrillation. And the idea is to support and empower primary care to deliver the guidelines um, in their own practices with their own patients. And part of the background behind this is those of us who uh, write guidelines know that when we're writing them, the system frequently doesn't support the kind of comprehensive uh, intense care for these very sick patients and that additional support is needed. And so the best care program means to be a guideline, a complete guideline module uh, uh, to support primary care. Um, we are focusing on COPD tonight and so I'm going to focus mostly on that, but imagine a module that has all of the recommendations in this presentation and more built for you, implemented in your practice. And we're getting quite good at this. We've done it 61,000 times in primary care practices. Your practice, your patients, uh, a short and brief encounter with you after a certified respiratory educator has completed an assessment and the program begins with patient identification, working with you to find your high-risk patients and goes right through the spectrum of diagnosis, action plan, education, uh, and enhancing pharmacologic therapy, case management, and it's an ongoing relationship between you and the educator. There are a lot of high-risk patients in uh, primary care practices. We have um, about 33% of our population. In the last three years, we've seen uh, more than 7,000 patients. About a third are high risk. And so those are the people we're finding. We are improving quality of life in this population and, and over a three year interval, maintaining that improvement in the quality of their life. And we have substantially reduced hospitalizations and ED visits in the randomized control trial, 40% reduction in hospitalizations, 
in our program data, 60% reduction in hospitalizations. And when we look at the impact on a system level, comparing where we've been active in these three regions on the left, actual system-based hospitalizations for the entire region substantially reduced compared to sister communities where the program doesn't exist in Ontario, where the rates were uh, generally uh, positive and substantially more positive. And compared to Ontario, again, very favorable system-based changes. So best care uh, can help you to implement the clinical practice guidelines for COPD in your office. If you want more information about it, I would encourage you to reach out uh, to me uh, and I would be happy to provide you with more information about how best care can support you and your patients that are like Mary. I also would like to identify additional resources in the Lung Health Foundation, including virtual self-management visits with a certified respiratory educator, providing many of the elements we've talked about tonight the toll-free lung health line, tailored patient education sessions, free monthly telephone-based call-in support group um, uh, for people living with or for caregivers of people living with lung disease, and online exercise-focused video series to activate and mobilize your patients. So it's my time to turn things back to Tony. I'm a little longer than I thought. My apologies, but I'd be happy to take questions. Um, thank you so much, Chris. I, I loved how you um, weaved us in and out of your presentation and, and, and Mary's case. Um, uh, I've got a couple of questions, and then if I, I'm hoping we'll have time, I, I, I've got one for, uh, of my own. But um, one question was, uh, is downtown Toronto smog considered biomass fuel or excess time outside on days when air quality is bad? Is downtown Toronto smog considered biomass Mass fuel? Yeah. Is that the, the, the question? That's the question, yeah. Um, I think about biomass, I'm thinking more around um, products of combustion that come from wood smoke and um, um, forest fires and or in the third world where various things are burned for heating and cooking. Um, and I think more about downtown Toronto in the realm of um, uh, automobile exhaust and diesel particles, PM 2.5, etc. Those things that are um, generated through industry, etc. So well, I know in regions in Toronto, fire smoke exposure and whatnot are an issue and to the point where there, I think, are some bylaws around that to reduce uh, that type of exposure. I think I think more about industrial type or car type exposure in big urban areas like that. Okay. That's great, Chris. Thank you. Uh, another question. Um, with respect to reversibility, would you consider post bronchodilator FEV1 increase of 300 mils, but only 11% diagnostic of asthma? Um, this um, uh, attendee says she's seen this discrepancy and just does not know how to diagnose and treat under these circumstances. In particular, should uh, they use ICS or not? Yes. No, I think that's a tough question to answer, but um, I've, what we have are guidelines, and the, the guidelines that we have have a recommendation of 200 mils and 12%, but it's a guideline, and so I would encourage the uh, person answering the question to consider other aspects of that clinical story. Uh, was there asthma in childhood, asthma at a younger age? variability, which sounds more asthmatic, night cough, which is frequently more asthmatic, an allergic individual, and put the whole profile together. And if it fits 11% and 300 mils would be good enough for me uh, to lead to a diagnosis of asthma. There are times when I'm reading pulmonaries 
where I don't see the change in FEV1, but I see big changes in mid-lung volumes, 2575 or FEF50, where I'm going to report that back as does not meet ATS ERS criteria for reversibility. However, I'm noticing significant improvements in this range, and this may support a diagnosis of asthma in the right clinical context. Okay. Uh, Chris, I'm going to I'm going to put you on the spot because we were getting some great questions. So, uh, I put on that thinking cap. A quick refresher on ICS and eosinophils. Sure. So, um, because so much work has been done in asthma, uh, there has been an extension of that type of work in the COPD population, and in looking at studies like Impact and trying to identify who seemed to benefit the most from inhaled corticosteroids, it seems like a cut point of around a peripheral blood eosinophil count of 300, that's what we would have called it in the old days or what's reported out as 0.3 now, that's an eosinophil count that's in the normal range, not elevated per se, but a peripheral blood eosinophil count of more than 300 makes it more likely that your COPD patient is going to respond or improve with an inhaled corticosteroid, improve by reducing exacerbation rate, improve by, imp uh, by in increasing uh, FEV1, uh, by uh, having a change in symptoms. So having said that, it's a guide for you of those who are more likely to respond. But if I had somebody like Mary, who had a low peripheral blood eosinophil count, I would still be trying an inhaled corticosteroid in her case uh, to see if that would make things better. The other final part to answering that question is, if you have a COPD patient who has quite a high peripheral blood eosinophil count, 700, 800, 1,000, or 1 1.0 in the new categories, pay close attention to that uh, you, you may find that they, in fact, do have a lot of eosinophilic or, or what we would classically have called asthmatic type features, and uh, they may benefit from um, higher dose ICS, uh, and I certainly uh, would be concerned if they were having a lot of exacerbations to try to aggressively manage that uh, eosinophilia. Yeah. And that leads really well into the next question um, from an anonymous attendee. Would you have preferred switching um, to labalama or triple therapy for Mary? Yeah, uh, that's a good, a good clinical judgment question. Um, I frankly think I would have prescribed triple therapy for Mary under that circumstance, although uh, wearing my guideline hat, I think uh, that's that is skipping a step. Uh, but she was quite significantly impacted by her disease even then, and I think you could justify uh, advancing to triple therapy um, uh, uh, to enhance her benefit because I think she's getting there anyways right. based on that profile. Okay, and how helpful, effective do you find the mucolytics to be in practice? Any drawbacks? Yeah, um, I don't use them a ton. Um, I, I guess my go-to is azithromycin. I use it a lot. Um, I, I Comparatively so, I've been very impressed with a macrolide for those very frequent exacerbators. I assess them to see, do you have anything that makes me think you have an atypical infection in your lung? Um, and if the, you are concerned, they may have an atypical infection, like they have systemic symptoms or an abnormal x-ray. Uh, I think a specialist should be involved in that decision. But um, if this is an individual with frequent flare-ups and chronic bronchitis and no um, you know, competing concerns, I advise them that macrolides can affect their hearing. I check their cardiogram to make sure their QT interval is not prolonged. Um, I, I ad advise them that I can select for resistant organisms. However, generally, we don't see any increase in resistant organism pneumonia. 
I tell them it's probably six months to a year of treatment that we're thinking of, and I generally go there. I do use NAC, not nearly as often. I haven't found it to be as uh, effective in my practice. Wonderful. Um, now, uh, is Best Care COPD available in Ottawa and Canada? How would you refer? How, okay. how can they refer? Yeah, well, thank you for that question. So right now, Best Care is, um, our focus is, um, um, has been on Ontario Health West, so the four LINs in the southwest of the province. However, we have a long-standing relationship uh, with uh, Connecting Well um, in the Ottawa Lanark region. And so if, um, if you can reach out uh, to me um, through the uh, moderator of this program, I would be happy to connect you through. And our plan is to formally link with the Ottawa Lanark folks so that best care can be available um, as well in Ontario Health East. Wonderful. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to squeeze in another two questions, if we could, before we end up. Can you tell us, uh, no, so for patients with severe COPD, uh, maximal therapy and chronic CO2 retention uh, with common hypercapnic respiratory failure without infection or pneumonia as a cause um, requiring BiPAP, do you prescribe overnight BiPAP for these folks? Oh, that's a very complicated case. Um, we have access issues still in Ontario. Um, there, so the question really is, has been the subject of some debate over the course of time. Uh, earlier studies looking at home ventilation, home BiPAP for end-stage chronic hypercarbic respiratory failure patients generally were negative, generally did not clearly show a benefit. However, the pressures in those studies that were used for the BiPAP frequently were relatively low compared to what's being done in the modern area era. So newer studies have suggested benefit and there is a movement toward uh, utilizing home BiPAP for patients with severe hypercarbic, severe chronic hypercarbic respiratory failure um, in COPD. That then that becomes a resource issue about um, how do you get the machines and who supports these individuals in the community, um, et cetera. But uh, I think the quick answer is I don't have uh, my very severe patients on home BiPAP yet, but I feel like that is the direction uh, that, that the evidence is moving in. Great. We've got two really uh, important questions. I think that our group is still hanging in. Can you tell us when, when in a patient's course you would refer to pulmonary rehab if, if available? I feel the emphasis is often on this intervention almost too late to make a difference uh, uh, to quality of life. Yes. Uh, pulmonary rehab is, uh, you know, the gold standard integrated disease management program. And where we know there are benefits, I think very clearly are uh, in the early, the first four weeks after having a hospitalization studies done then show very, very clear improvements. Uh, in longer term patients, um, I suspect the participant is correct. If we referred someone who was significantly dyspneic earlier to rehab, for all of the elements of care, uh, that it provides education and exercise, supervised exercise, lifestyle modification, et cetera, that they would likely benefit from that. But the reality is that of those individuals uh, that are out there, probably a quarter million high-risk people in Ontario we would never have enough spaces. And so the practicality of it is, although people I think would benefit um, people who have uh, a reduced quality of life or people that have exacerbations would benefit, access remains a very significant problem. And you know, uh, Chris, I'll, I'll just one more, because I think, you know, we're still hanging on to all of our participants and we're still getting more questions. So there you go. Uh, okay. what, about OPEP, what, <laughs> what about OPEP therapy devices? 
Yeah, so um, what we're talking about is um, a positive expiratory pressure device. Uh, do they have a role in COPD? Um, so I'm going to share with you uh, sort of my preference or my experience. Um, these are devices that um, I don't frequently use in COPD. Um, um, if we're thinking about other airways disease where there is a lot of mucus production, such as in bronchiectasis, for example, I will frequently trial one of the devices to see if it helps with mucus clearance. And I usually pair that with a, at least a consultation visit with the chest physiotherapist to instruct on bronchial toilet techniques, coughing techniques, to instruct on the use of the positive pressure or the oscillating positive pressure device uh, in order to help um, uh, with bronchial toilet. I've occasionally done that in COPD patients with a lot of productivity, but not very often. And you know, Chris, we, we have one final question that I think, uh, 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 well, it was a final until I, I spoke up. But anyway, this will be the final one in interest and in respecting our, our participants' time. Where does opiates, uh, where do opiates fit in uh, the management of severe dyspnea? Um, well, there is a role. Um, no doubt there's a role for people with um, end stage um, uh, COPD uh, where there is a uh, expressed goal of care for palliative intent. Um, uh, opiates uh, can be used uh, judiciously to assist with uh, reducing the sense of dyspnea. They do work. Um, you will find them recommended. Uh, and so there definitely is a role. Um, I don't know if the uh, participant is asking around uh, nebulized opiates. We used to use those in the past. I, I think they've really um, gone out of favor in favor of, of um, oral uh, uh, short or longer acting agents. Okay. You know, in fact, that was the last one. Uh, my, the last comment we received on the chat was actually um, uh, some advice that uh, one of the attendees, uh, attendees is sharing. So, Chris, thank you so much. I think uh, you did a wonderful job. I thought it flowed really well. I think the questions and the nature of the questions really reflects how you touched on areas that, that are relevant to most of the folks on, on the call. So, Thank you very much. Thanks to Claudia and her team and Jennifer and her team and, and to all our attendees. Uh, all the best.